Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Alfonso Sinjago, and my colleague's not here, Winston, Winston Goico, but we work together on this project. He works in the Dominican Republic, and I go there every summer to collaborate with him in XCP for development projects. And um, our subject today, our, our session title is how we're using mobile devices for developing personalized learning environments in the Dominican Republic. And the reason we decided to work on this subject is for two reasons. One, we think it's important to increase access to lifelong learning and at the same time to think of personalized learning environments in a setting where there are more limitations as well. So those were the research reasons and there were other reasons as a development project why it made sense to us to do this type of initiative. And uh, thank you for being here. Um, so let's see. Uh, so Jamie, where are you from? Um, if you could all point in, in the map where you're from, that'd be great. Um, so I am actually from Venezuela. I'm not, so if I, if I have a thick accent, that's why. Um, I'm trying my best. One of the things they told me is that I need to speak slowly in English because uh, sometimes it doesn't travel that well or it, it's, it's hard to understand. But uh, so um, yeah, if you could all point where you're from. Uh, so I'm from, let's see if it works for me. Uh, Let's see, there we go. So this is where I'm from, um, but this project's here in the Dominican Republic. I cover both Haiti and the Dominican Republic with that scribble, but uh, yeah, which is actually something relevant to this study as well. Um, so we decided to work on a project based on the idea that while these mobile devices, we use smartphones, so a lot of people have feature phones. Um, but we're using smartphones for this project, low-end smartphones, for the reason that to us, feature phone is important, but a lot of people, in, in, because of the income level in the Dominican Republic and also because of how smartphones are seen as a luxury item, but at the same time, a status symbol, and people want to have them, that eventually over time, more people are going to have them in the Dominican Republic, and it was important for us to think ahead and, and have some foresight into what will be relevant for them in, in a short amount of time. What will they be using in the future? So as a pilot project, um, there's an article that came out about too many pilot projects right now, so pilotitis, and, and this is a, a pilot project. But we wanted to focus on the future of mobile learning to some extent and thinking of what they'll have available in, in the near future so that we could anticipate some of the problems that we're going to run into when we scale the project and make it accessible to more people. Um, I would love to hear your experiences in mobile projects. I don't know if any of you have worked in a mobile project before. Uh, it'd be great to uh, talk about your experience at the end of the presentation later on. Uh, I'd love to. If you want to raise your hand, if you uh, worked in a mobile project, that'd be great. Um, that way I get an idea of who's worked in, a, in, in one of those projects. But um, we, yeah, we decided to use uh, a smartphone for it because they are actually not that expensive in, in the big, in, in the scheme of how the, the, the level of acquisition of how, what people can purchase in the Dominican Republic, and the fact that there's so many different Android phones available that um, they're actually not that pricey. So this is the phone that we use for the project. Um, and they, they sell for $50. So it is pricey in terms of maybe some places in Africa, but even in Latin America, it, 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 for a large scale project, it is not necessarily too pricey. So it's something that they can consider people having in the future. And, um, and not, not just in the future, but a lot of people already have phones that are better than this one. So we chose a low end phone for that reason. It, it, it would simulate better the realities and some of the limitations that are gonna have with a technology that it's very powerful, but at the same time, it's not as powerful as some other devices that are being used in, in Europe and the United States. Um, one of the things that to us was important was to have a device that had a, a SIM, uh, well, a SIM card, yes, and also an SD slot, so an extendable memory, because connectivity, even if you have a phone, is very expensive. So to us, having access to an SD card was probably uh, the the most important thing uh, or, or one of the most important elements of the project because then we could include them with a lot of open educational resources. 
which was one of the aspects that we wanted to make sure that were included. Um, I'll share also. So these are some of the resources we included. Let me see if this works here as well. So it included a lot of educational videos. It ended up having around 12.5 gigabytes of, of data, uh, in addition to the four gigabytes that the phone has of space for applications. But instead of focusing on what can those a million applications in Android can do, which, I mean, they can do a lot of things, and that was part of the, the, the focus of the study, too, we also used the DSD card as a way to deliver educational content. And that included a course on how to learn English and um, also how how could they learn something that they wanted to learn for their professional development? What could they learn that would benefit them long term individually? Because as an andragogy type of study and case study, we were interested in how would they be able to learn whatever they wanted to learn through a mobile device. And the Dominican Republic was our, our, my place of research for a couple reasons. Um, one of them is that they have a, a long history of underperforming in education. So they invest less than 3% of their GDP in education, which is pretty low. Um, yeah, the, the, the materials, the course materials were local. To Some of them were. And the ones that were not local were like with subtitles in Spanish and ways that could be understandable or helpful for them. Um, so there were both resources that were more internationals and some resources that were specific to the Dominican Republic. So there were a lot of books about history of the Dominican Republic and other resources that were very relevant to them in particular. Um, but again, the Dominican Republic has underperformed in education um, historically, but they do have as one of their development or large nationwide projects an extension initiative run by the vice presidency, which focuses on having, it's a very, it's, it's now a decade old project, and it's gone through four phases, and it's called the Community Technology Centers. And, and this project focuses on having um, people access to ICT in remote regions of the country. So let's see if, I'm mean, try to show an image of the scale of it, but, uh, they're located everywhere. It started in 2001, and, and since um, they are over in 90 places in the Dominican Republic. So this is kind of uh, that's here on the other side on the on the west will be Haiti. Um, so there's a lot in the border with Haiti, and, and because in the Dominican Republic it's uh, you know it's one of the poorest countries in Latin America, not as poor as Haiti, but it does have a lot of issues in in terms of development. Um, Reaching some of these places, even though distance-wise may not be that far away, the infrastructure is very limiting. So sometimes there's nothing in, in those locations apart from um, a couple of, you know, couple of government buildings, and, and at the same time the CTC. So the community technology centers are, with many of these places, the main educational center to some level, and, and definitely the main telecommunications place. So they tend to have. Uh, radio station, they tend to have English lessons, they tend to have uh, also technology classes for digital literacy, so they have like Photoshop, Word, Excel, and a lot of other courses that help them learn basic digital literacy skills. And that's uh, something that's great about the project, it has a span that is kept growing, and it still is a little bit centralized. A lot of the materials come from the capital, and right now we're working on how we can improve distance education and, and having uh, through the capital uh, a service that they don't have to come to the capital anymore, but they can learn what they need to learn locally as well. But yeah, they're, they're, uh, it's, it's a great project to work with, and I wish Winston was here to talk a little bit more about it because he was one of the, the first 10 people that started working in the project, and he's picked uh, or worked with the project for over a decade now. Um, I worked with it only for uh, two years so far, and last year we just focused on what were some of the needs and concerns of the people. We did a lot of um, descriptive get data gathering to what were some of their concerns locally and what the CDCs have given them or what they felt they attributed to the community. And um, a lot of the responses were 
that the CDC was very positive and influential, but at the same time that it was losing to some level relevance in the communities because it was getting outdated. And part of that was because mobile technology has surged in some of these places, but also because their private connection may now be better and just some of the sustainability problems that a project has focused on extending instead of necessarily focusing on improving in a few sites, but just trying to have more sites, has to be able to provide in all those sites uh, a good infrastructure. So there are some infrastructure concerns with the expansion of the project, and, and that's, I mean, but it has been um, a way for Dominicans to learn not just digital literacy skills, but also basic English classes, and English classes are pretty important to them because of their tourism industry. So that's one of the subjects that was included in the mobile phone. It's how can they help them learn English also through mobile devices. And, and they had, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we included in the devices, but it, it didn't only have static content or videos or, and reading guides, but it also had um, some applications that they could use. Some of the problems there were connectivity in, in terms of not all of them had a good connectivity with the mobile devices. So uh, why did, what is the reason for using mobile devices in this case? We didn't want to have an initiative such as a one per one initiative and everybody has a mobile device or, or something along those lines in terms of us purchasing the device for everybody, but rather how can we use the devices they already have in their hands and they're already using on a day-to-day -day basis for communications and that they themselves see as an essential good as a device that can do more than that. How can we focus on improving their mobile literacy and their information literacy and those aspects so that they can get more out of a device they already own or if they don't already own that they might own pretty soon from now. Uh, we have right now it's around 91 per 100 persons, 100 people in the Dominican Republic have a phone. Now that's not taking into account that many people have two or three lines, but there's a high mobile density and that's growing quickly as well. So, and that's, I mean, something that's happening worldwide. Right now we have uh, 6.8 mobile devices per and around 7 billion people, and, and not just mobile devices, but mobile device subscriptions. And that's gonna change in 2014, so there'll be more mobile subscriptions than people in the world, probably, according to the ITU. But, um, so there is a lot of potential with these devices. And again, we focus on something that we felt was a low cost alternative, not a high end uh, iPhone or, or and the newest Samsung, but how can we have something that's low cost that is likely to replace feature phones in the future. And in that same idea is the whole Mozilla Firefox operating system that recently came out, and also the Ubuntu operating system. So there are other alternatives in terms of mobile to replace feature phones. Uh, one of the reasons we stuck with Android was because to us, Android kept also uh, the whole app market that it has. And being Linux in, in its core, it, it, it felt to us that even though there are alternatives such as Mozilla OS that's growing in Spain and in other places, and Ubuntu OS, that Android was the best choice um, currently at least for us. And that could change in the future, but we do think that it's such a rich um, potential with the, all the apps that it has, but also the type of system that it is that allows for people to use it in many different ways. They can use it to connect a USB drive. They can even use it as a projector sometimes if they connect it to a Pico projector so uh, and project their slides. So they can do a lot of things with a mobile device. And it's how do we harness the potential of those million applications in a more, in, uh, at a low cost uh, so that people um, can use them for their personalized learning and also for learning, like improving their English and also any other subject they're interested in learning more about. So one of the key elements that we've been trying to promote is not just the use of open educational resources that can be remixed, reused, revised, and, and redistributed, but also um, their creation. And in terms of creation, that's been one of the hurdles is that it's been easier for them to use the, the open educational resources in the Dominican Republic than promoting a culture of creating resources. Um, part of the, the initiative, the pilot project included how can they um, create them and maybe record interviews with people in the, in the town they live in and gather information about their local history and things like that as well. So the project does have an element of how can we share local voices and local cultures 
globally so that more people know what's happening in the Dominican Republic or what's happening in those particular communities through mobile devices, but that's been more limited uh, in terms of its effect. So I'll, I'll get to that a little bit more later, but right now it's been more of a consumption of open educational resources through the mobile device. So um, one of the questions before was what did we add to it or what did we integrate in terms of open educational resources? So a lot of the books from the Gutenberg Press were included and they have over 40,000 books that are openly accessible and quite a, I mean, we included a quite, quite a good number of them, thousands of books within the device so they could pick a book and personalize the learning to learning from a book they were interested in reading. So also uh, options were given to them of selecting a book that they were just interested in in Amazon if they wanted to and we could purchase this book for them if they, if that was, if that was the book that they wanted to read. Um, but there are so many open resources that many, uh, I mean, the participants opted for um, the books that were openly accessible most of the time. And there were also applications that helped with this as well. You know, you have Wattpad and a lot of applications that are X number of free books, for example, um, and many of them allow people to access hundreds, if not thousands of books uh, quick, easily through a mobile phone. But we did include a good number of them within the SD card just to facilitate um, them having access to it. And one of the elements in mobile projects is usually not taken as much into account that was a major concern in developing this project were the cost of connectivity or how are they going to have a 3G connection when even if they have a phone that they use for communicating and knowing what's happening with their families, how are they going to really pay for a 3G connection when that's a lot more expensive and that's actually uh, the access to 3G connections or, or, or mobile internet are, is not as high as how many people have adopted mobile devices because of the cost. Uh, in, in those terms, we decided to include the content within the device, within the SD card, and also to focus on areas where they also had access to Wi-Fi. And, and that's, I mean, the, the community technology centers have that potential moving forward. There are over 90 centers. Ideally, those centers would all have a Wi-Fi connection in the future that allows people in the community to come and use the telecenter. And what a community technology center is, it's really a, an extended telecenter. So it doesn't just provide uh, access to a, a computer and an internet connection, but it also provides access to many other community resources. So they even have an amphitheater to holding community events. And, but we wanted to not have to rely on connectivity and all the resources that we included, apart from open textbooks from the Gutenberg Press, were um, that are now actually just part of the public domain because the authors of all those books have died and 70 years have passed. But we also included a lot of TED Talks, for example. Um, some we consider having like there was a, a version of Wikipedia that was offline as well, but um, that we considered, but that was a little bit too large of a file, so that wasn't included. Uh, but um, they did have access to also hundreds of TED Talks. And surprisingly, in a sense, was that they were pretty, um, they felt that one of the best resources that was included within the mobile devices for them was those TED Talks. So they learned a lot from listening to experts. And I always find TED Talks interesting to that level because TED Talks have, um, and in a sense, it's a teacher-centered education to some level because you're just listening to people tell you uh, whatever they're inspired by, telling you great ideas they want to share. And it's not really a student-centered education. And thinking about how you use TED Talks in a personalized learning environment was to some level, um, I mean, it's like, well, you're just listening to experts and that's what you're doing. And uh, rather than, um, you know, something that's more student-centered, but they did find experts from just international experts through TED Talks, pretty inspiring, and that was the reason they were included. They were included to inspire them. Uh, we felt that if it's a short-term project, there's not that much time for them to, to be part of this project because it's um, a project they got to do in addition to all their other responsibilities. And the people that partook, took part in the project were primarily, as a pilot project, uh, people in the capital um, that decide the policy for the rest of the community technology center. So instead of right now focusing on the remote communities, we are focusing on the places with the best internet connection so far before we think of what other places in the Dominican Republic 
will be able to, to use. So while eventually we do want to spread the project to all the different IT technology centers, um, we decided to pilot it in the capital and also working closely with three, tele three community technology centers that have a higher level of internet access and quality that um, are closer to the capital too. So in, in a sense, I mean, it's going to take a while for this pilot to, to spread to the rest of the country. And, but one of the goals that we are thinking about is replacing their, their office phone or how do we get all the instructors and people that, um, that are in charge of these telecenters to switch their phones because they have a phone that's provided by by the the, the main uh, by the community technology centers of the capital by the administration. When we, they replace these phones, the whole fleet with smartphones. That if we could think of a smartphone that would allow them to be part of a project like this of a mobile learning project that they could um, just develop their own learning experience and use it in a way that was customizable to them, and then have that access nationwide. So we do hope to expand the project nationwide, and that's the goal, but uh, starting in a sense with concentric circles. So over time you'll get there, but it, it does have to, um, I guess, continue to expand in, in concentric circles. Uh, in terms of the TED Talks, whether we're in Spanish or in English, um, somewhere in Spanish, but most of the best ones are right now in, 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 well, not most of the best ones, but most of the ones that are in TED.com, for example, are in English. And what happens is the ones in TED.com, when you, they're, I mean, they're all CC BY. When you go to download them, you can download them with burn subtitles. So they have burn subtitles in Spanish. So all the ones that were selected had subtitles in Spanish, but the, 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 the voice over was in English. Um, that was a compromise, in a sense, because they were selected based on categories. So I'll go back and open uh, the, the other page um, where the files are online for a second. So these were the videos that they, they had. They had two types of videos. Some of them were videos about Dominican history. So here we have, like, um, this is a famous series, for example, of the problems they had before they became a democratic country. So that was available to them. Um, and they had other videos of Dominican history. So in that, in those are completely in Spanish. The ones that were in, in English were primarily the the TED talks. Some of them are in Spanish, but they're classified by category. And these are again the, the resources they found most interesting to them in in ways of extending their creativity. Um, and that's one of the first ones that they uh, were asked to watch so as part of the project is how to start a movement. So they they could think of well, we can think outside the box. We can um, be empowered by these devices and also just construct our own educational experience. So they had some about education as well. Um, and they all, if you can see, the titles are in Spanish, but the, many of them are in English. Uh, they do have subtitles burning to them. If they were all in Spanish, that'd be better. But since one of the goals was for them to get better at knowing English, because, I mean, that's just a skill people want to have worldwide, and also because that's a skill that is pretty important for a country that has such a proximity to the United States geographically and where uh, tur tourism is such an important part of of just the, their, their, their economy. The serv they have a service economy where uh, over 60% of the economy is, is based around service, and the biggest chunk of that service component of their economy is tourism. So many of them do go to the community technology centers to learn English. So here are some of the English learning resources that I mentioned before, including many um, three different courses in advanced uh, expert and different ways that they could learn English through through videos and, and also uh, text and other resources. Um, and also applications as well. So Duolingo was an application they really liked in terms of improving in uh, their English. Um, because one of the problems with these other resources of learning English is that they were more static. And, and we wanted to them to have uh, more dynamic resources, but then that's where connectivity comes in. It's hard for them to have a resource that's dynamic without connectivity as much, because then it has to be an application that's all downloaded into the phone. and since it focused on personalized learning environments, 
we didn't want to fill them up with applications that were already selected by us, but rather let them select their applications instead. So yes, there are over a million applications, but if we are truly trying to have them develop personalized their environment, we don't want to limit them to just the 20 we installed or the 30 that we installed. We did install some within the device, uh, like English learning ones and also a book reading ones uh, like Wattpad and others, but we didn't want to fill it up with applications for various reasons. One of them, we didn't want the phone to just get too slow and clog down because it had too many applications already running. And we also wanted them to download and explore more within the application market. Um, so that was the other part of it. Um, with a million applications out there, there are many that do the same thing. So it's more about finding the one that works for you. However, that said, I would argue that applications weren't used to the level that we expected them to be used. And I mean, that's regrettable uh, to some level, but it was good to find that out because what happens is, um, yeah, we applications need connectivity. It's not only about um, the applications like Twitter or Facebook that require connectivity for them to be used because they're part of the web 2.0 and they need to send and get data, but also you need the internet to download applications. So we could have a lot of application files within an external hard drive, but those would be outdated. So it was hard for them in a lot of cases to download and use as many applications as we wanted them to use through an Android device because even if the application was a completely offline application, it still had to be downloaded. And even if we provided them with an APK file uh, through through the card itself, which we did, if I show you guys uh, the, the the parts that we added to it, we did include uh, APK files in the application backup and restore folder. So that all, everybody on their phone had the ability to install some of these applications and translate e-readers uh, and office application um, Adobe, uh, along with other ones. So these ones all were installed in the phone, but even though those were added to it, um, we um, we didn't add as many. And, and also, um, so there are some here about Dominican history, for example, like Dominican newspapers, Dropbox. I mean, this is quite a good number, but not, uh, uh, not all of these were added to the phone, actually. So they had access to all these APK files, but not all of them were install when they receive them. So this is one of our free books because we did want them to have flexibility with the phone so that they could themselves pick new applications they wanted to, to add and explore the app market itself. Uh, so that's something that we were committed to as when thinking of a personalized learning environment. And in terms of, so this part, especially when we think of a personalized learning environment, usually Moodle, is um, you know it's a learning management system can be a part of a learning of a personalized learning environment, but to some people, I mean, there there are distinct ways of thinking, right? Like a personalized learning environment, if you're an adult learner, you're trying to map and develop your own connections and learn through your through those connections. Whereas Moodle is more linear, and you're learning from the the course that was designed by an instructional designer or, or the the instructor to learn in a particular sequence. Um, However, we, use, we did use Moodle to have some sort of structure with some of the elements, even though some of the assignments within the course that they were taking in Moodle to improve their use of the devices had a lot of elements that ask them to explore their personalized learning environment. So part of the exploring the personalized learning environment was that they were asked to, to create it, to build it. Uh, one of the first exercises was for them to map out what their current personalized learning environment was like. And, and develop it further, and, and then exchange that, uh, that diagram with other people in the course so they could expand their personal asset and environment. So um, do we need Moodle moving forward? Maybe not. We have thought of using Facebook as a learning management system because a lot of people do use Facebook already. So one of the, to me, surprising parts of a, a, a learning, uh, uh, the Dominican Republic so far has been that they have already, in a lot of places there, in a sense, use, would use Facebook as a learning management system. So while we are trying to use an LMS to improve the communications between the capital and the different remote regions, all the different 90, 90 community technology centers, 
they are already to some level using Facebook for some of those tasks. So we don't know if moving to Moodle is actually the right way to go or whether we should just improve our use of Facebook as a learning management system. And there's some arguments to why doing either way. Um, the reason for Facebook has been primarily that they, the students themselves in those 90 centers have a Facebook account and it, it's complicated because in some level we are subsidizing Facebook use and, and that's like well you have 90, 90 community technology centers and most of them are students using Facebook in their free time but that's the part where they interface with Web 2.0 technologies so why don't we use that the fact that they're already connecting to Facebook to do something through it that simulates or has a lot of the elements of a learning management system. So um, that has something that it's it's an ongoing discussion. Uh, you could we we could use Facebook closed groups for a learning management system to some level because you can have files and have polls and other things. But Moodle is much more sophisticated. Uh, but they do have a problem in having students use Moodle to to even uh, even the level that would maybe justify switching from Facebook to Moodle because sometimes the use that they have for something like Moodle is very limited and, and not using many of the like assessment tools that it has, like the quizzes and other elements that make Moodle as robust as it is. Um, so in terms of personalized learning, um, yeah, like and one of the, the questions that I saw that came out was, um, parts of them mapping their personalized learning environment and yeah the, it is complicated to map a personalized learning environment and connectivity was the part here that it's uh, the biggest hurdle they're having so they're using the, the, the mobiles a lot for being able to access that content and, and the content that was already included so we're talking about the books the, the videos uh, but they're not connecting as much as we would like them to connect to uh, blogging, for example, is not really that common or, 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 or like searching through blogs. So, you know, if you have a question, usually when we ask them um, about information literacy, uh, many answers are, well, I just go to Google and I search for what I want and whatever comes up, that's the right answer. So there's not really that much of um, assessment of how good the quality of the materials they're using or getting through Google, for example, are of high quality or not. So. There are some of those concerns there. Um, the idea was, however, of the pilot project, and it still is, is for them to personalize their learning. So, um, and, and that's the, the difference maybe in some level of how the internet is being used in the Dominican Republic, where even though we have 90 centers and they're all connected, it is web 1.0. It's not the web 2.0 of, well, I have 100, 100 different educational tools and I use SlideShare and I use all these different programs to, to improve education and like I use video and different medias but in a lot of ways their use of the internet is a little bit flatter than that and it's mainly for uh, accessing information and um, without improving connectivity uh, I, I, it's going to be difficult for them to have the type of personal learning environments that people do have in, in Europe and America and other places so um, I think that's a long term goal for them to improve their personal learning environments and we'll keep having those exercises so that they at least become more familiar with the tools they have available and learn more about the different educational tools that they could use and how people are using the internet in different ways to connect with more people and learn from other experts um, and just have communities of practice around Ning and other places like that. But um, that it's going to take a while. Uh, we are trying to do that through them personalizing their use of applications uh, to some level so they're deciding themselves what applications they want to use um, and, and deciding part of the project was well what do, what do you like what what would you like to learn through a mobile device and uh, how do we get there so um, you map your personal asset environment you have a learning goal and how do we develop uh, our use of the device to reach that objective how do we personalize it so uh, on what type of activity should we use, what type of resources should we use, so what apps, how can we find the best apps for learning X. Uh, let's say X is I want to get better at making jewelry. So one of the students wanted to get better at uh, I want to create jewelry so I could sell it as an informal 
economy activity and gather additional income uh, for for my family and just because I like it. So that's what she wanted to do, and it's um, and she wanted to see how she could use a mobile device for that. So part of it was, well, can you use Etsy, for example? Well, that's really uh, you know you could use it for inspiration, but you know, not much for selling. You're in the Dominican Republic. Could you use Pinterest for ideas? Yeah, you could do that as well. Uh, what else could you use? Well, maybe eHow or, or something like that. Uh, so we started exploring different resources that somebody, that she could use through her mobile device to learn better about how to manufacture jewelry uh, through them. So she did use it for that, and that was great to, to see her do that. Another person just wanted to become better at administrating things, and he kept mapping ways that they could improve CTCs through a mind map application, and he would use the diagrams in mind map to, um, and he really enjoyed that exercise. He, his favorite app was probably just mind mapping through the phone, so he kept mind mapping different things through, I mean, and it's a small phone, but because uh, we didn't have one of the larger tablets, we just had a small a smartphone, but he did have quite a, quite a skill creating different mind maps through it. So that was nice to see as well. And that that was the part that they were personalizing as well as choosing the book they wanted to. And when I show you all the list of videos, um, there were some videos that were recommended to them through the learning management system that they could use on or, or, or see on a weekly basis the recommendations for them. But a lot of it was what would you like to learn? Would you like to focus on development? Would you like to focus on education? Would you like to focus on, on um, would, would, the, would the videos on innovation be better for you? And also seeing those resources as a, as a teaser, not really as all the resources they are. So some were selected so that they could have an idea of what's available out there, um, you know, but they could go in and go through the internet and go to Khan's Academy or something like that if they wanted to learn something else uh, through the internet. Um, but it, it, it was less left up to them to both personalize the applications and personalize just also using what videos they wanted to use and what ebooks they wanted to read as well. So the participants were chosen not by me. How, how, like, well, they were kind of chosen by me, but um, not. They were chosen mainly by the head of the program. He wanted to pick particular people that he felt. Um, so I did have some say into what participants we would select for the project. Um, that was that happened during the summer. Um, but he wanted certain people that he felt would be best for a pilot project um, because they are influential within the administration of the project too, and they're listened to. So he wanted people that others could see as role models to some level so that it could snowball maybe from there. So that was part of what we're thinking about. It's like, how can we get this program not to just be in one of the 90 centers that nobody knows about and, and then disappear, or how can we have it with participants that can allow it to be more public, visible, and perhaps snowball from there, uh, and also get better feedback from them. So. As uh, maybe, I mean, I, I hope to, to hear some feedback from, from you at the end of the presentation. Um, the feedback from participants was pretty helpful in us thinking of how we can improve this project moving forward. Because we do think that mobile is going to help. We're not thinking of buying devices. They already have the device. But we're thinking of um, how can we use those devices they have better. And if we do distribute devices to every center for the administrators and the instructors, how can they start to use them in a more um, interactive way and in, in, in a better, uh, in, in not just use them for their phone calls, but use them in, in a way that they use their personal computers maybe right now. So, and, and from instructors then, we hope to have courses in all the community technology centers, in all 90 centers, about mobile literacy and personalized learning environments and, and what they can do for people in the communities. but. We are started with, with the instructors and the administrators just because uh, we see that as a way to, one, uh, for the importance of teacher training, because if teachers know how the project works, the better. And, and if they know themselves the importance of mobile literacy and personalized environment, the better. So focusing on instructors for us was a way for, one, make sure the devices weren't stolen. So that was a concern. Like, if we distribute devices, are they going to get stolen by students or, or disappear? Um, that's not a major concern, but that is a concern. If they're distributed to instructors, we have a greater level of accountability. Um, so that was 
part of the issue as well. But primarily it was the, the idea of it passing the knowledge down in a sense or or sideways. Uh, as I, I'd rather see it be called sideways, but uh, there's still a lot of a teacher-centered mentality or, or tradition in the Dominican Republic, more so than facilitator and learner is still a teacher-learner idea. Um, but yes, so that's uh, how the project is right now designed. And it, it will take some time to expand through all United Community Technology Centers. So right now it's really localized in a few places. So yeah, we would like to have the SD cards. Um, there are various things we thought about this, like even to the use of a Raspberry Pi to some level. It's like how can we have, if we do create um, a database that's pretty extensive, let's say, that the problem that we have here with the SD cards though is that we're only talking about the, I mean, an SD card has a cost too. So even though the phone is around $50, an SD card is going to run you another $15. So that's another cost too. Um, so that's something to take into account. But they could switch them. They could give it to somebody else. They could put it in a new phone so that another phone later on can use the same card. Um, or we even thought of having like a Raspberry Pi and having and the the content there or more content through a LAN system. So there's the Rachel Pi uh, initiative, for example. We thought about that or uh, something along those lines, but having a, a LAN system so that people could access the educational resources. So that might be a way for uh, for others to use them. However, we were trying to reduce as many hurdles as we could, and one of the ways to do that was to make sure that every phone had an SD card. Um, that's the model we're using right now. But yeah, they could hypothetically, I mean, they could do a lot of things with it. So, so one of the things that people did do, and not hypothetically, but it, it, they happened, was with the videos, for example. Because it's a small screen size, a lot of them fell um, that even though it has subtitles, it's a pretty small screen size. So it's not ideal in terms of sometimes reading basically subtitles, right? So um, one of the things that they did was plug in the SD card into the little converter, like through, from micro to normal, and then put it in the computer, and basically watch the videos on their computers at the office or, or wherever they could get a computer, because then they would have a, a larger screen, uh, and it'd be easier for them to, to read the subtitles. So having the subtitles all burn into the videos was great, but having a small screen, has some limitations even with media like that. Now, if they were all in Spanish, it wouldn't be a problem. Since they were trying to learn English, we didn't feel that bad that they were in English in that sense because that's one of the things that we're trying to learn is get better at English. So that talks in English with subtitles in Spanish. There's actually an application that was based around that premise um, in iOS and Android of how to learn English through TED Talks because the subtitles are in a different language and, and the audio is in, in another one. So that it has even been used as an application itself for uh, for language learning. I don't know how effective it is, but uh, I do think that um, in this case, uh, some of them, since they were trying to, well, the, their their feedback has been that since they were trying to learn English, having TED Talks in, in English wasn't really uh, that much of a problem. And they had subtitles as well. But yeah, uh, no, Raspberry Pis are, I mean, actually one of the things with Android that um, there was a question about Raspberry Pis, it's, uh, it is, they're, they're pretty nice. Um, they are a lot for hobbies though, and they can be a little bit uh, sensible and, and just sensitive so that they're, they're easy to, to for some reason not work as well as we want them to work. So I, I am thinking that small stick Android PCs may also help in the future. So we are also looking at um, there's the Recomatic like Android PCs that you basically just plug it into an HDMI and then all of a sudden the, the t whole TV becomes an Android PC. So um, and those are also like fifty dollars. So maybe Android itself will take some of that place later, and that might actually make it so some of these apps they're using right now may uh, be more transferable if we move from just using Linux in a Raspberry Pi or, or just having some sort of those, uh, server used through them, but 
uh, instead of that using them with Android itself as well um, or using Android sticks to to also share content but um, yeah it's going to keep improving so who knows what's going to be available in a couple of years uh, but again the biggest problem with the project so far for developing personalized learning environments not um, not in terms of like the use of the device itself in terms of the SD card, the SD card was being used and the content too, um, but we were thinking of having them build a learning environment that was personalized and they limited themselves a lot of the time to the resources that were in the device instead of the ones that could be found through the internet because of low connectivity levels. Uh, just because you have a uh, dial-up internet, in this case they don't have dial-up, but they have a DSL connection that's shared by so many people within the technology centers that both the Wi-Fi and the LAN are very slow uh, to the point that it feels like dial-up or worse sometimes. So connectivity, even though it's there, if it's too slow, it, it can be just frustrating to people to to be able to to learn. Um, or, or connect and, and download resources and, and use new apps, for example. Um, and then time constraints are a problem uh, with just adult learning sometimes and and people in the Dominican Republic in particular it seems to be a problem in terms of motivation um, for them because of just the, the demands that they have in their work and even though the high levels of the administration recommended the project for them, um, and, and selected the people to participate, they came up, I mean, they, their remuneration or, or it wasn't going to increase their salaries or have any sort of short-term benefit for them. They had a lot of long-term benefits, professional development benefits, um, but when you have time constraints, sometimes you're more focused on what's urgent and what's just the, the problems you have tomorrow. So there was a lack of urgency to some level in, how important it was for them to to just continue to explore and not just do the bare minimum or uh, do what they had to do to use the mobile devices. So for them to develop a personalized center environment, maybe more time for them to just explore, it's important for them to just, uh, and also feel that it is an, an activity that's going to be rewarded, uh, maybe professionally in terms of uh, them being listened to more by their boss when they make a suggestion about a subject they know or, or just if they keep taking educational courses and professional development being considered for a raise or something like that. But it's actually um, their motivation can be pretty low. Uh, one of the traditions so far in my experience with people that work in the Dominican Republic is that you get hired and then you pretty much never get a raise, but you get more responsibilities and inflation hits your salary too. So it happens that you came in with a salary, now it's been devalued for 10 years, you earn less in relationship to an international currency or the dollar, and you uh, have more responsibilities. So, um, so motivation is an issue within the project, even though we focus on key people that we selected as administrators and, and learners. We still, uh, motivation, especially expanding, is going to be a problem uh, for them to, to explore uh, more through the mobile devices, especially when we take into account that they have connectivity problems as well. So maybe, I mean, one of the things that we were concerned with was that we included just too many things to do within the mobile device. Um, in a sense, that resembles the internet because the internet has that surplus of information. We have too much data billions of queries in, in, in Google a day, 100 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. So content is, I mean, everywhere, right? So in a personalized environment, you do curate your content and curate those relationships that you want to have. And you have a million apps, so you don't use a million apps. You use maybe 30 or 40 apps, but you pick them uh, selectively and you pick them for, for a purpose of, of your intended purpose to learn or, or for professional development for, or for just whatnot, whatever, you know, pay your bills or whatever you want to use them for. But um, we did include a lot of content within both the SD card and just uh, the course in general. And that was perhaps um, too much to expect them to both map their personalized learning environment, see how they could use it for learning what they wanted to learn uh, through the mobile device, becoming familiar with a mobile device they weren't too familiar with before, so having to also get used to a new learn uh, operating system, 
um, and, and even some resources, many of them had never seen a TED Talk before. So it was also, in a sense, familiarizing themselves with Web 2.0 and, and some of the education technologies that are being used in developed countries. Um, so that was another hurdle, and that hurdle is going to continue as the project thinks of expanding across the country as well. They did enjoy the videos quite a bit. Um, the ebooks were a problem within the mobile devices because, and, and yes, we did have an app that had like a, a local news. Um, that's a good question because I haven't, uh, you know, I, all all the participants and oh, I mean, I, I, we were still in contact with each other. And I, I'm going to find out a little more how their, uh, the news apps that were included how useful they were for them because there were some news app, not Slippery or something like that, just like Dominican News. Um, and I included them there. They were included there for that reason, to include more local content. And I haven't heard how much that was used. And, and that would be good to know how much they used that, that app in particular. Um, but in terms of ebooks, even though they had yeah, thousands of Gutenberg Press books, um, Reading them is a problem to read, or, or they could choose a Kindle book if they wanted to as well, or a Wattpad. Reading them was a problem in a small device. It's a small screen. You can zoom in with your fingers because of the touch screen, and you do have a lot of more flexibility when it's a smartphone instead of a dumb phone or a feature phone, but it's, um, it's still a small screen size. So um, that's a limitation to being able to use the ebooks so far. And again, like I mentioned before, I mean, the apps wasn't just an issue with apps that require connectivity because they function that way, like flip, like uh, Twitter or Facebook, but just apps in general require people to be able to at least browse through the App Store. So I haven't been able to see a distribution of the App Store that stands alone or that you, know, you have the whole menu, the ratings and everything, but that it, it can work without a connection because it has all the apps within a file system and they're all within a hard drive or whatnot. So because part of it is how you find the right app to use in a mobile device. I mean, there's so many of them. And one of the skills that so far both Android and iOS have been really good at is having an app store that allows people to locate things quickly and be able to find the right app and have good recommendations, et cetera. So it wasn't an issue of apps that need connectivity to function, but how do you even go through the whole searching process to, to personalize your your learning when you don't have that catalog of options available with descriptions and reviews, et cetera. I don't think it's that hard to have that offline, right? Like hypothetically, we could have that all offline and, and distribute it in, in a, who knows, 100 gigabytes, a hard drive with a bunch of APK files and a file structure and, and reviews, et cetera. But I, I, I haven't seen a distribution for it in, in, any, in any form yet that's offline. So it, it's hard for them to then, even if they have a good Wi-Fi, let's say, or a good LAN connection, and they could go to the CDC and try to download the right app and personalize it that way. Right now, that's not available, so they need the Internet, even if the local uh, connection through the LAN is, is fast. So getting rid of the Internet there would be very helpful, and I hope that a distribution like that is developed. So that would kind of get rid of one of the hurdles of how do we use the App Store more effectively. But that would only be possible if we use, like, APK files that are, for example, free or, you know, just a lot of freemium or free apps for the reasons that you also need the connectivity to be able to pay for them. And, I mean, many of them, even though free ones, rely on apps for revenue. So, I mean, connectivity is an issue in terms of using apps for, for personalized learning. And I mean, one of the biggest problems is, yeah, it's in many ways, it's just the problem of where they are right now. They are not in the Web 2.0. I mean, forget Google Fiber and things like that. I mean, no Web 3.0 or anything like that. They're definitely in a more static web. And that limits how much of residence they can be in the Internet, and they're mainly visiting the Internet. Um, and hopefully that changes, but it, it's going to take a lot of, of investment. Um, to, to do that because they have spread themselves a little thin in, in having 90 different community technology centers across the, the country. 
but uh, it all comes down to I mean there's so many there's that blog the Afri Gadget blog the the blog that I think is great because you see all the ingenuity and Dominicans are very ingenious and I think many people in developing countries are because you do what you can with what you have so overall if if the right people or the people that want to learn have access to these tools they'll, they'll figure out a way to do it and they can learn quite a bit and I mean we can help by having maybe apps offline and, and, and just resources that are easy for them to access um, but the device itself has a lot of potential because of the many things that it can do I mean an audio recorder, a video recorder, a uh, camera so you could ask them to interview somebody in the community you could um, ask them to take pictures like use the accelerometer, use the, you know, the GPS. It has a lot of functions that even though a feature phone is great and it has a lot of potentials too for SMS and, and learning, and there's a lot of more added once you go to a smartphone and once you go to all those different sensors and, and elements that a, the smartphone brings. So if people have access to it, hopefully when we keep improving this, this project, They'll, they'll have better results, uh, but we do hope that since they are located in those 90 different places across the country, that there will be people in those places, and, and we know that are interested in using mobile devices more effectively. So um, once the instructors uh, become better at um, using the devices and, 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 decide, and then they're teaching a course in mobile learning in the different centers, uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of students that have the desire to learn uh, and it's pretty important because of all the other limitations they have in terms of time and in terms of connectivity so uh, and, and it's just a part of andragogy as well uh, but uh, in the community technology centers it services both right adults and, and, and youth so that's another part that I didn't mention but the technology centers service everybody um, so that's uh, I think that's the last slide. Well, uh, yeah. So looking forward to, uh, to your feedback. Um, again, it's a pilot project. I know there's uh, a lot of things we gotta work on, um, but that's what we're trying to do. Is in a sense, the CDCs, uh, as they were initially, their their main comes. The, they began in 2001 from a project that started from MIT and in Costa Rica, and it was a retrofitted container with technology. And those containers were placed in three places in, in Costa Rica and two places in the Dominican Republic. Uh, the containers themselves were appealing to investors but not to the local people because it was in a, a foreign little box basically that came to communities. But it was successful in attracting a lot of attention locally and, and even internationally when they started with containers. But that, they moved out of that phase a long time ago into then having like community looking buildings in phase two and then phase three was adding a lot of community elements such as a radio, an amphitheater, a garden and other elements to, to the center and now in a sense it's like well they have pretty good infrastructure in terms of physical infrastructure we have a lot of courses in terms of digital literacy and uh, we have or, or just Photoshop, Excel and Word there's uh, English courses and, and, and a lot of other resources in the Community Technology Center but it's how do we deal with the fact that people increasingly have a very powerful technology also in their pockets and how do we bring them to the tele center or, or the community technology center to learn the skills that they need in the 21st century and improve their personalized learning as well. So uh, that's in a sense like phase four you could say of, of the project and um, any feedback of how we can both uh, use LMSs more effectively, uh, personalized learning environments more effectively or mobile technology more effectively, I'd love to hear from you and uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the, the presentation. Thanks. So I'll, I'll answer some of the questions. Um, so the centers right now are financed by the Vice Presidency. So uh, the project used to be uh, a nonprofit project and eventually the Vice Presidency took over the project. So they're um, financed by uh, the government of the Dominican Republic. They're actually redoing their main homepage is CPC, let me see if it's, okay, there we go. I'll, uh, finally, yeah. So that's the main homepage um, for the project right now.
Yes, um, I mean, we were, you know, the, the, the phones had a keyboard, uh, but they also had the swipe application. That's an Android application that lets you slide to type. Um, I'm biased towards swipe. I think swipe works better because people can type quicker through it. But we did include one with a keyboard on purpose because we felt that if you had a keyboard, people that didn't like the, the fact of typing through through a, a, like a, a touch screen could also have the traditional or the other way of typing through the keyboard itself. Um, I do think that, I mean, we saw what BlackBerry did. BlackBerry was known for the keyboard, and they got rid of the keyboard. So, yeah, there does seem to be a move away from the keyboard. Um, but, um, yeah, we did include a phone with both a keyboard and a touch screen on purpose for that. I mean, the devices had quite a few. I mean, every device has a lot of disadvantages. I mean, it's a low-end uh, smartphone, and a low-end smartphone is not as as powerful, as capable as, let's say, a 4S or or the, the newest Samsung, the Note 3, or something like that. You know, there there's some limitations. It's also not a tablet, so for learning, um, we didn't want to give them a tablet. I, I previously worked in a one-to-one -one tablet initiative. And that is really expensive because, I mean, even though tablets are better in the terms of a bigger screen, um, tablets also are not a device that they need as an essential good. They don't use their tablets for phone calls or, like, just for their day-to-day -day business. So kind of the idea was how do we use the technology they have for their day-to-day -day activities for learning as well. So instead of buying a new device, how we use the one they already have. I mean, because we're doing that, we're not using a device that was necessarily defined, designed for learning, right? So it was a device that was designed for communication and consumption to a, to a good level, not creation. So even though, for example, there's a lot of drawing apps, uh, drawing with your fingers is not that good. Uh, so there are some limitations to the device because they're not designed for learning, but there's a lot of good applications too. So uh, we just think that by choosing a device that um, they already are going to maybe have because it's a status symbol or they already have uh, or or they have it in you know in, in their to buy list or that they simply in a sense need because a lot of people do need smartphones or not smartphones they need feature phones they need feature phones to be able to to connect with their families because I mean they're not there's not a growth in landline so um, so we're just trying to use a device that they're probably going to need uh, in terms of a phone or they want to have in terms of a smartphone. In terms of voice search, um, no, we weren't paying for, like that was the other part, since we don't know if they, I mean they had data access, a lot of them because they were paying their own data. Um, or they were going to places with free Wi-Fi. But we didn't want to pay or subsidize their data plan because we felt that that would be very artificial or not artificial necessarily. Um, I mean, we could pay it for some people could buy their, their own data plans, but um, we felt that it would be very costly too over, overall. Like it's not just the, the cost of the device and, and the SD card, so that's $15 and 60 or 50 depending on the phone. But it's a lot more money uh, if you include also a data plan. So uh, we wanted them to make the decision themselves. Um, so the CDCs have free internet, so they could come to the CDC and use the Wi-Fi there if they want to, or the Wi-Fi in their office if they want to in the capital. Uh, but we didn't want to subsidize their 3G connection because then that, that would bring up the cost quite a lot. So anyway, anybody has any other questions? Um, well, thank you, John. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's great to to be able to um, have a conversation with all of you. But yeah, if you want, ever want to keep talking about uh, anything related to mobile learning, I'd love to uh, learn more about your your opinions and ideas and and ways we can uh, do it better.
Thank you, Kathleen. I uh, appreciate your comments as well. Okay.